pentagram dedicated to Henry Foreman. In the year of the primal war, from the war of terrestrial birth, man mastered the mammoth and horse, and man was the lord of the earth. He made him an hollow skin from the heart of a holy tree. He compassed the earth therein, and man was the lord of the sea. He controlled the vigorous steam, he harnessed the lightning for hire, he drove the celestial team, and man was the lord of the fire. Deep mouth. Good afternoon, good evening, good whomever, good wherever, good however I may find you. This is Alan Averill. This is Agitators Anonymous. This is episode 76, if I am not incorrect. Last week's episode was an interview with Christian from Portrait. Maybe you checked it out as a video cast over on my video channel. Uh, there will be a few more of those coming up soon. And I may direct you to my Instagram, Nymthiango underscore primordial, blah de blah de blah. Um, my Patreon also. There's been um, there's been some good stuff going on on the Patreon lately. Some um, alternate versions of songs, some rehearsals, some strange stuff like that. Some book discussions. Yes, it's like an old fashioned book club. There's um, been some interesting um, opinions aired. Lots of interesting discussions going on including bonus podcasts, all that kind of thing. There are no tears because I don't really understand how that works. Um, but it's a pretty cool little sort of, I guess it's sort of like an old fashioned uh, fan club. Can I say that? Sounds odd and a bit, um, well, wrong to say, but there, I've said it anyway. Like many other things that I've said over the years that appear to be wrong in hindsight. But there you go. Anyway, so... Um, go over there if you want to become a member for as little as a dollar, a dollar uh, a month. Like I said, I don't really understand how the tiers work. So there you go. The show is sponsored by MetalBlade.com. If you're in North America, go over there and use the promo code ALAN and you will get um, free shipping. All sorts of good stuff there if you want to order some of the old Primordial albums even. Who knows? Um... And also the show is sponsored by Eisenwald Records, www.eisenton.de in Europe and .com in America. Go over there and use the same promo code ALAN and you will also get free shipping. Go and take a look. The links are under the description over on the YouTube channel. Um, so there you go. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, it's been a bit odd. I've been compiling um, two digital... I'm not going to call them best ofs, but let's call them introductions to Primordial, um, which are just going to be digital sort of releases. They're not anything particularly definitive. Um, I did put quite a lot of thought into what should be on volume A and volume B, which, as you can imagine, when you have such long songs can be quite difficult in so many albums. Um, I tried to think a bit about the flow, all that kind of thing. But um, lately, as we've taken tentative steps into returning to playing live again and live music um okay admittedly now there won't be anything since those two shows in germany for quite a while and like i said many of you have listened to many of the podcasts and it remains to be seen whether um we are really going to be uh, allowed back into a room to enjoy live music inside as we knew there's going to be various bureaucratic hoops to jump through. Some countries are moving at different speeds. In fact, that's one of the things that really epitomizes this entire situation. The emergency, as I keep saying, um, which is a throwback to 1950s Ireland. But one of the things that's so obvious about this whole situation is that every country is moving at different speeds. But like I said, um, the let's call it the authoritarian horror of Australia, of what's happening there, seems to be something of a warning to some elements in other countries who maybe are less under the, uh, shall we call it, the globalist thumb than some people would like to portray who are moving in the opposite direction because it seems like a something of a warning from history. Um, and Ireland seems to be following suit. Now, the country is not open. There are still no shows, no gigs happening, really. But there's a lot on the calendar. And they're talking about the, uh, the finally opening up the extending, uh, you know, opening up the um, 
licensing laws to bring back the nightlife into the city, that kind of thing. I mean, I'm sure of it is uh, some, some, you know, something, some of it is surely a tourist decision because the city had fallen into such a state of disrepair that people were just literally getting off a plane and heading for the west of Ireland. We had some good weather there for a while and blah, blah. Oh, God, am I really talking about the weather? Yes, how dull and boring. Let's get back to talking about some music. Yeah, and so... In the last month or two, I suppose, as my anger and my frustration and my um, quite understandable um, feelings towards having had, I guess, um, your identity stripped from you, your um, ability to earn all of those kind of things. But more importantly, the communion of making music, all that kind of thing. Um, the thing that you've known for so many years, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Listen back through the podcast, you'll hear how um, frustrated and angry, and of course, I suppose my sense of injustice at the whole process. Or else you can just think I'm a spoilt Westerner and that I should really just shut the f up and accept the health and safety mantra. Either or, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle ground. But I certainly didn't give myself much space to really consider. Um, what does having a career mean? Um, how do we assess that in modern day? And over the last few weeks in the month while compiling this, these um, compilations, which you should see next uh, month digitally, if you aren't following Primordial on Spotify as a monthly listener, um, do go over and do that. Um, it really sounds a bit crass, but um, it helps the spike in the numbers, all that kind of thing. And when these digital compilations come out, you should get notified of it, etc., etc. Or do you? Or does it work like that? Who knows? I don't know. I think it'll come up in your single of the week stuff. Um, and also, you know, of course, some people are going to be, um, you know, find some of my uh, choices a little bit curious. But what it did is in the last month, let's say four, six, five, six weeks, a bit more, um, it provided me with an opportunity to really sit and think about what that what does that mean so I'm going to attempt to try and get my head around how we accidentally had a career um, how does it move forward all those kind of things and it got to me thinking about how um, how such small things that you choose to do um, end up having immense repercussions I suppose they would have called it that butterfly effect thing a butterfly flapped its wings in Tokyo and causes a tsunami in, well, you pick somewhere that you don't like and think about that. But I've done, I suppose, various podcasts where I've discussed about the, the real early days of the band. Um, but what I didn't really, I suppose, discuss is uh, maybe our frame of mind, our state of mind. Did any of us really think about things like that? Did anybody really in Ireland in 1991 um, stuck on the rock off the coast of Europe, well, really off the coast of the United Kingdom, um, the last outpost before the US and A, did bands like ours really think they would have careers? I mean, it is quite strange that if you think of the, the metal scene, let's call it the class of 91, um, the bands that popped up then, whether they're Baden Incarnate, Crookon, or people involved in Sentinel Records or Invictus Records or Double and Metal events, um, there's plenty of bands from then who are still going and many bands have come up in the in-between and disappeared. So did we really back then as young Dublin teenagers think about the idea that we would have a career? Um, it strikes me that having a career sort of happens by accident, especially when you come from the underground. When we started, our aspirations really were to just maybe make an album. We were looking at fanzines at bands and names like Rodding Christ and Varathon and Masters Hammer and getting their first, you know, passage to Arcturo, The Ritual, um, splits with Necromagia and Varathon. And I suppose that the height of our aspiration when we started the band in 91 and all got together, I answered an ad in a shop in Dublin called The Sound Cellar. This was in let's say, July or the start of August 1991, before my 16th birthday. Um, and I was the only person who called the phone number. And the ad was uh, papered over with some other gig poster. Um, and actually, I think was only up for an hour or two. I think I got the gig, as they say, just by virtue of having very long hair and some cool, let's just say it's cool, some T-shirt or other. Um, I mean, I couldn't sing, couldn't do anything else. Got my parents to drive me out all the way to the... Uh, what I didn't really realize was, you know, 15, 20 kilometers away. Um, 
And the very first rehearsal took place in uh, our bass player Paul's bedroom. His parents were off out at somewhere or other. And we all lived in, you know, dreary uh, suburbs of Dublin. Um, dreary, rainy suburbs of Dublin. That's my memories of them being violent and grey uh, and always raining. Um, and I suppose our aspirations at the time were really, people say it in a romantic way, in a kind of nostalgic way, they go, oh, we just wanted to get out of the burbs. We wanted to get out of all this. But I don't know. I think that's maybe something you choose um, or you maybe think more that you, you think that you thought yourself that more in hindsight. But at the time, you don't really think like that because um, you're not really getting on a plane going places. If you were a band maybe from Holland, let's say in the early days of the Thanatos, God dethroned, pestilence scene, um, I guess maybe you could, um, if you were in Enschede or you were in uh, so southeastern, you know, um, Holland, you could maybe trade a gig across the border with, uh, let me pick a band out of the thin air, Morgoth, and you could play, you know, a youth hall in either country, I'm sure. Well, I'm not sure. I'm, I am sure. Bands from Belgium were playing in Holland. They maybe could go to the northeast of France. Bands were trading gigs all across um, Europe. This was not really open to an Irish band. Um, Ryanair hadn't really cleaved, um, I suppose, the culture open. I mean, people give Ryanair a lot of uh, hassle, but I'll do a little bit of props out to them. Um, they opened, let's say, Europe up, the world up. I mean, look, you can, you know, let's say pre-pandemic, you could sit there on a Wednesday and go, you know what, I'm going to go to Marrakesh tomorrow. And... I've looked at flights and gone through the whole trip in my head. And, you know, if you planned it, you could get there for a 1999 on a Wednesday. That's the kind of flight that in 1982 would have been a thousand pounds or something. I mean, it was the equivalent of on our earnings in 1991. I often talk about this festival in 1994 that Promodio was, um, was supposed to play with Dissection and in flames and we couldn't go there. We got money in an envelope and all this kind of thing. But paying for those flights was the equivalent of five, six hundred euro in today's money. Um, and you think about 20, let's say 10 years after that, 2004, we were able to fly to Germany to play for 29 euro, 39 euro um, return sometimes. Every now and again, you can still get those. Of course, this is pandemic notwithstanding its influence upon the conversation. But... We didn't really, um, we couldn't, we were on a rock on an island stuck off the coast, as I said, of Europe. And um, we sort of evolved and mutated, let's say, um, on our own. Kind of like, you know, those species of animals that only really exist on Mauritius or something or um, New Zealand or Australia or something like this. I'm struggling for islands that were cut off from Pangaea or whatever you want to call it um, and so you couldn't really trade shows you could trade a show across the country you know to Galway or Cork we didn't even really get up to Belfast until like 2000 or 99 or 2001 or something even even cross border gigs in the early 90s didn't really exist we didn't really go to Belfast at all for gigs and those guys didn't come down for gigs here it didn't really start to open up a bit until 96 97 I don't know what that says about the state of the country or the troubles or anything like this but certainly Primordial was not being invited to play in Derry or Belfast in the early 90s we got we played maybe once, twice, three times a year, usually on the floor of pubs in Dublin um, if any of you have the demo Dark Romanticism on CD or the vinyl from Van Records, you'll see, you'll hear two songs which didn't make the demo that are recorded basically on a boom box in the corner beside the stage. And they, they sound amazing for that. But um, that was just us playing on the floor of a pub. We didn't know anything about backstages, about monitors, about anything like that at all. We didn't really learn any of those things. And we didn't trade gigs. There was one band from Ireland called um, Asphyxia who turned into Morphosis who are sort of like the, you know, the sort of grumpy uncles of our scene, we could say the granddaddies. And we used to sit in the corner of their rehearsal room and listen to them rehearse back in 91, 92, 93. And they were the only band that we knew who had proper amps, not just little shitty combos. We used to rehearse on a, a guitar, was a PV 30 watt, very just feedbacking. 
um, a small little old H&H bass amp, which actually, in hindsight, wasn't such a bad bass amp at all. We had poor instruments. Kieran had a Charvette copy. I think it's a really... It makes even um, like a sort of... Char it's, I guess, shaped like an 80s thrash guitar. Um, Gamma Bomb guys, they would collect it. I'm not sure if the bright orange would be bright enough for those guys. Um, but the Charvette was a kind of Charvel copy. Um, as for, I don't even know what bass Paul had. I think it was a copy of a copy of a kind of a Fender. I just remember it weighed a ton. Um, I sang through the stereo. There was no such thing as a PA through this cheap, shitty microphone. In fact, if you, if anybody is a, a real collector, there is a primordial song on a compilation cassette called the Ta um, Compilation of Nursery Rhymes in A Minor. Don't ask me about the title. And there's a rehearsal of The Darkest Flame, which appeared on our first demo. Um, and that was recorded through a second microphone in a boot, a shoe, sitting in the middle of the rehearsal room, which we recorded all in one go and then just, um, rehear you know, as a rehearsal and just sent it in. And that's like um, somewhere in the middle of 1992 that song appeared. I guess it's the oldest um, primordial songs that have appeared. Well, actually, that's not true in the box set of um, <clears throat> which album is it? Where Greater Men Have Fallen, there is a seven inch, which was the seven inch that we never got to press in 1991, which has two songs, Nefarious Affliction and Prince of the Sky, which are a rehearsal October 1991, sort of autopsy on Leash de Sameli, primitive kind of death metal, death black metal, sounding really strange, I suppose even a bit South American or something like this. Um, worth tracking down um, if you cannot find that. Well, I'm, not, I'm sure you can find it somewhere. Um, but the point is that back then we our aspirations were very, very small, very limited, very local. Of course, we were we were all into the underground. We were writing letters. You were sending off letters. And I couldn't wait to record the first rehearsal to just have something to send to the guys from Sentenced or Varathron or Necromantia or, hey, I have a band. Look, check out my one song on rehearsal. And we tried very hard in those September, October to kind of come up with something that was worth even trading with somebody. And those are the two songs that appear on that seven inch um, but it really um, it really made me think about those early years, this kind of little, shall we say, relaxation of my um, state of stress and tension at not being able to play live, not being able to travel, not being able to know if there was a future for uh, while well, this, you know, this this um, life that you'd built up over the last 29, 30 years, because maybe I didn't mention that but this is the 30th anniversary of primordial which sounds so re so strange to say somebody said it to me the other day they were like 30 years god damn it and i said yeah isn't that weird like because i joined the band right after my 16th birthday actually it was i think the week after my 16th birthday so the reality is as five people we aren't actually that old we all kind of started off with bands when we were i mean I guess it's been said in another podcast. People don't really realize this, but Primordial, Kieran and Paul started playing together, I think, in November 1987. Um, if the romance of the story is to be believed, um, Paul just called over to Kieran one day and said, do you play the guitar? Yeah, OK, I've seen you around wearing a simple tour T-shirt or whatever it was. Do you want to try and start a band? In the beginning, they were playing like sort of DRI stuff, Misfits, SOD, um, uh, some sort of proto-death metal. In fact, they recorded a demo in 88, um, which has is sort of primitive death metal um, with sort of <laughs> vocals. And I think the guys were 13 and 15. Um, and one of the songs, the intro riff, is the intro riff to Journey's End. There's something for Nerdist to complete as out, completists out there. Um, I'm not sure if it's worth digging out to let people hear. I may have to ask the... Um, uh, I may have to ask Mr. Gawley himself if that is something he might wish <laughs> to let people hear. But yeah, the the history of in, in 87, 88 is a quite a romantic sort of early teenage thing. And there was because I think people who maybe have grown up um, with the Internet um, or post Internet don't really understand quite how it was growing up before the Internet. I mean, analog living. Um, you know, is a romantic, nostalgic concept, but it really was like that. Um, 
every teenage um, boy that I knew wanted to start a band um, and many teenage girls as well. I mean, I remember the music room in my secondary school was always clogged up with people wanting to do something or and I have to thank the, all those old music teachers I had when I was 13 and 14 who let you on a Wednesday bang around on drums and tried to play, as I remember, um, trying to play Ramon songs, trying to play Misfits, trying to play Venom. And I think we even played in the school hall to friends of mine um, in maybe 1989 and um, trying to play, I think, I remember GBH, um, State Control, State Control. We tried to play GBH. And we tried to play Dead Kennedys, ding a da ding a da ding a ding a da ding a da ding a da and um, Venom. I think we tried to play a bit of black metal and that kind of thing. And so that's just something that most teenage kids tried to do, tried to escape, as I said, from those. Well, I'm putting it romantically now, but those dreary grey um, suburbs of uh, Dublin. Like I said, and I've said it many times before, and people don't quite believe me, but Dublin was a pretty gritty, pretty violent place back then, and you were always getting into fights, and if you had long hair, that's just what happened to you at, a week, at the weekend or going to gigs. There was, there was mayhem at the gigs back then, late 80s, early 90s. If you want to go back to 30 episodes of the podcast to talk about the death metal, I do the podcast about death metal gigs from 30 years ago. Yeah, I, I do talk a lot about about the aggression and violence but like Dublin was a in my opinion in the 80s a second world kind of city didn't have first world aspirations people weren't going on holidaying across Europe and um, it was quite an insular country with a lot of migration a lot of poverty a lot of religious oppression um, it was a poor place and I think that there was a thriving vibrant sort of musical scene of people trying to do things but I remember um, even in the early 90s when we came along we started we were the, I think we were the first bunch of people into rock and metal who were really writing letters sending out demos the bands we used to go and see um, who were a bit older than us who always had cool gear and this they did it seemed to me like they were waiting for Island Records to show up and offer them a contract and go oh you want to go on tour with Metallica or Ozzy okay cool here you go but we aimed our sights significantly lower and we were really, I think with Primordial, we wanted to make something like um, our own version of Passage to Arcturo or uh, Wisdom of Darkness by Belial or Beherit or like we, we all we really wanted to do was maybe to just make um, one album. The idea of going on tour seemed even quite beyond um, because tour dates were mainly things that you just saw big bands in Metal Hammer and you saw Hammersmith Odeon, you saw... Um, a few dates in Europe sometimes but we weren't we didn't really get the European dates because obviously we got UK magazines we only saw that if maybe somebody managed to get out uh, to Germany or France on holiday and pick up a copy of um, I don't know some European magazine that was the first time I ever saw like the Zecca Carl wow in Essen and which were venues you, you eventually go on to play and they had a kind of air of I suppose, mystery about them because they were just names that you'd read in a mar magazine. I remember in 1989 standing outside the Marquee Club, I think in London, I got to go to Shades and I got to stand outside the Marquee Club and they were legendary. Hammersmith Odeon, all those kind of things. They were legendary names that you grew up with as a kid and you couldn't imagine yourself playing there because you couldn't really imagine how you were going to get off the island. Like there was no way that Primordial um, was all four of us were going to emigrate to somewhere to try and make it happen because we were underground bands. We weren't aspiring. It wasn't 1986 and we weren't aspiring to be, um, you know, a kind of version of a metal version of U2 or something like this, which I think an awful lot of the generation just before us tried to do. They thought we all have to emigrate and this, that and the other. Our idea was more we have to write good music and write a lot of letters. And that's kind of how it happened at the time. But the idea that you, um, like I said, somebody said to me the other day, how did you get here? And I just thought, wow, you're sort of like, you have an accidental career. Um, and all of a sudden the years go by. Um, I mean, I may add that with the um, the caveat that it's a, a career without, <laughs> a career without um, really much financial reward. And that's possibly one of the reasons why it kept being a career. Because um, a band like Primordial, whether you know or believe it, is not a professional band. We're not a band who does tour twice a year, who have sources of income from other kinds within music. If you were to compare Primordial to Satyricon or something like this, um, it's completely different. Um, 
a difference in fees, a difference in past record sales, a difference in festival fees, a difference in being able to have the space and time to tour twice a year to make that money up or whatever you want to call it. We were never we were never stuck in an album tour, album tour cycle because we were never um, making a living for that really to be a consideration. There was a moment, of course, when it seemed possible, 2006, 2007, 2008, 10, whatever. And, you know, it's not to say that you don't make some money, but to make a living from being a musician would, I think that's probably the backbone fundamentally of having, um, let's call it a career in the in a mainstream sense. Of course, you have a musical career. That's different. But you do, people do assume that you make a living from playing music. And the fact that you don't, I think, places the ability of making a music, making music, making an album like Exile Amongst the Ruins. Like I say this in a romantic way, but I st you, know, you stand there listening to Kieran or watching Kieran listening to his riff tapes. And he is... Um, you can hear, um, you know, the, his kids in the background and you can hear noise and he's actually working out his structures in in the settings of his family life. I mean, you know, which is quite incredible to me um, as I can't even read a book in my own apartment because there's too many distractions. But the fact that, you know, um, all, Primordial exists within um, a very um, musically in a very normal um, frame framework in the sense that well I suppose normal post 1990 or normal post streaming and digital digitalization in the sense that it ain't 1986 anymore it ain't 1996 so you take let's take a band like Moonspell who are maybe a, you know a sort of peers of ours from a slightly unfashionable country but they have Irreligious which is like 150,000 copy seller we have Imrama which was on Cacophonous nobody knows how many copies it sold it did alright but we could never go on tour we never took that step up to somewhere else until three or four more albums came out um, and it seems that our aspirations were influenced of course by the geography by our surroundings by um, the fact that we had no peers who'd made it quote unquote to look up to I mean if you look at the Swedish scene or the Norwegian scene or Finnish scene or whatever um, I mean, even, I suppose, the Greek scene had post-Septic Flesh, Rotting Christ, bands who'd started to make take the steps up. Um, even the aforementioned Portuguese scene could look up to a Moonspell who'd made it. We didn't really have anyone to look up to. We were the bands who were trying to treading that virgin territory on our own. Um, and so when somebody says to you, um, how does it feel to have a career? Um, it's... I think one of the things that somehow perpetuated was oddly enough the fact that we didn't make a living. That sounds like a contradiction in terms, but I suppose it meant that we never came to rely on it as our source of income. Now, I make no bones about the fact that I would have I would have liked for that to happen because I think that by the time the band got big enough, we were old enough for it not to really derail us. And I think Primordia would have happened and existed um, the same way musically as it did anyway only just that we might have been able to see some uh, greater reward for that or maybe have been afforded um, the uh, <laughs> the luxury of not having to work some shitty nine to five uh, <laughs> job as well as the other. Um, I think it's very strange that sometimes people seem to hold it against you if you make a living from playing music. It's as if they want you to be poor because they feel that somehow validates their own feelings uh, towards the art that you make. And there's something to be said for the poor, tortured artist, so to speak. But the idea that after 30 years, you don't maybe have a a, a, a house to show for it. And um, if you've sold some records and done some touring um, does seem a little bit strange to me and does really speak to the modern nature of um, the digital streaming um, society that we live in, that you can look and see millions and millions of streams and then you go, hmm, OK, the most expensive thing I own is a guitar. But I'm not complaining. It is what it is. Um, and it will be hard to really complain that much fundamentally about the musical side of the career, because let's be honest, the the uh, relationship between business and art has always been rather fractious and rather difficult for the artist to navigate. And there is other ways now to try and make a living. I mean, let's be honest you will probably make more of a living from um, pressing. You know, you'll probably make more money from pressing 20, 30, 40, 50 limited T-shirts than you will make from your digital sales for a whole year. I mean, and that's just the truth. You just have to figure out a way of, uh, 
well, look, you figure it out. I'm sure I've addressed all those kind of things in another podcast. But the idea that we were stuck out on this island um, and you sort of mutate and evolve in your own, uh, I suppose you're swimming in your own gene pool a little bit. You couldn't trade gigs across the way. I mean, that bit, that said, we did manage to get over to England in 1994, 1995 um, and start to play a little bit in London. And though that really opened our eyes up to um, how big another scene was. And we played with Cradle of Filth and Gorgoroth, I think, in 1994, 1995 in the Astoria. And we'd never played in front of so many people. And again, we stood up there and we didn't really know what monitors were. We didn't really know about amp settings. We didn't know any of these kind of things. We were, we had years of catching up to do from other bands who were able to, as I said, probably drive across with their amps and go from, I don't know, let's say Brussels to Strasbourg and go, oh, OK, let's trade a gig between Ancient Rites and X other band and all that kind of stuff. And so I think that we ended up with a career by accident. It just sort of became this thing that was like an institution in our lives that you didn't rely on it to make you money. And so therefore, um, you could leave it alone for three or four months because you had to get on with um, the rest of your life. I suppose it was a sort of form of um, analog living, really. Was it easier to have uh, a career or start a career back then? I suppose, and theoretically, it was because there's so much more music now. And now after 10, 20, you know, as the years build up, once you get to 30, you kind of realize that you've moved into becoming classic rock. How What, what a weird sentence that is. And you sort of realize that um, the angry state of your youth um, has a something of a veil of conceit over it once you are heading towards 50 and appealing to people who are 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. I mean, that's something that you have to question is um, I think the sincerity of your um, statements, the sincerity of the passion of the energy behind the music. And that's something we always try to be quite mindful of, to step outside and go, do we still sound like we are uh, vital? We are ener have energy, that we have meaning? Because it can be very hard, I think, um, to intergenerationally speak through um, music, you know, maybe. That's me overthinking it too much. Or maybe that's just the nature of heavy metal, which, let's be honest, heavy metal is a young man's game, fundamentally, really, when you think about it. And one doesn't want to be, how shall we say, the preserved stuffed moose, uh, uh, in the words of which what, that guy with the moustache and spinal tap. I know his name. I'm just pretending not to know it. Um, who feels like the preserved moose on stage. You don't really want to feel like a preserved moose. <laughs> you still want to feel um, vital and energetic and... Um, you know, you still want to feel that you have something um, urgent to say about the state of the world or whatever else before you settle back into what I've called over the last 20 months the uh, Fat Elvis years of my career or the dotage or the, the Empire Falls karaoke. Um, but how it happened, which is what I'm trying to get at in this rambling podcast, which I'll do, I'm going to do like a two part, you know, another part of this, try and maybe talk to Kieran, try and talk to the others. I, I, a few rambling series about the band because I felt that maybe I've ignored um, the band and music a little bit over the course of 20 months. I did want to very much separate Agitators Anonymous um, from, from the band because it is my podcast and not the primordial podcast. Uh, I think some people mixed, mixed those things up a little bit lately uh, when it comes to, when it comes, when it came to, um, you know, for example, can the cancellation of our festival appearance, at, um, they mistook my statements on Agitators Anonymous as for speaking for all of Primordial. And that's not really what the podcast is about. And I'm not going to get into that. But for the sake of these bunch of podcasts with these um, with these digital compilations coming up, I thought it'd be interesting to try and answer some existential questions. How does it feel now having had a little space where you feel a little bit less angry about the situation? Actually, um, looking back over the career, especially the last five or ten years, I never really took anything for granted. I loved the travelling. I loved landing in an airport and going, oh, fuck, we're on our way to Buenos Aires or Santiago or trying to hustle a gig in the Middle East or something, which I tried for years to do, or the first time you get to Russia or whatever else. The idea that you were there on, um, you know, your own uh, how should we say creative validity? I, I often use the analogy. Well, I'm not sure if it's an analogy, but where you drop the stone 
in the water and the ripples of the water move out and eventually they hit, they bump up against all these things and they are everything from the person who collects you from the airport to the sound and lighting crew to all the things that go together um, to the, the, the ripple effects out from that moment you picked up the guitar, write the song and that nature of that process never ceases to mystify me or um, I feel incredibly romantic about that process because it does seem like a, you know, notwithstanding a magical process that you, you, you make music and then it moves out like this. And so I never felt jaded. I never felt tired, which is maybe, maybe why I, I, the fact that it was an enforced break struck me so hard because um, I didn't want this. I, I want to do two times more, two times as much, three times as much. I want to do even more, which is why I do Dread Sovereign and Twilight of the Gods and April Men and just felt like this constantly have to move forward all the time. The idea of sitting and just taking a moment, a breather. Um, certainly when you don't know that it's coming back. If somebody said to me, OK, you have two years off now, go and travel the world and do your own thing. I could have handled that. But just an enforced, hey, can you sit inside and look at a screen? And we don't know if what you built for 30 years is coming back. Um, I, w I wasn't able to live or to sit easily with that as a process. But now that we see some movement towards some of that coming back, um, and I realized I also played my hand extensively with raging against that, and it gets a bit tiresome to hear. So maybe um, a little bit more discussion about the music was needed. But when somebody said to me last week, they just said, how does it feel when you look back on your career? And um, it really made me pause for pause to think, especially over the last month or four, five, six weeks. The moment where you just take stock, where you're just, you know, we were sound checking in Essen in the in the square and there were some people standing watching and this open air show in Germany. I was just kind of like, well, how many times have I done this? And it's still there's a kind of childlike thrill to stand on a stage with everybody and look at each other and go, oh, I don't know which song we play, but that, that the other, and you realise I could pick from a moment from 30, 40, 50 songs. And actually, it's far more than that. Um, and the idea that, you know, you can still be with the same, you know, this is going to be a bit, uh, a bit um, you know, people can take the piss out of me if they want or whatever. But the idea that the same five people, because we didn't, we never changed any members, really. We changed a drummer. We just, I mean, that was in 1997. Then we just added Michael. So we never swapped anyone or changed anyone. So, you know, it's very different to them when you see Vader or Marduk or even Rodding Christ or something. Well, you know, okay, who are their core people? But we're all still the core people. And the fact that you can still get along and make each other laugh and have a good time um, standing up there, um, even during the sound check. And just like trading silly jokes and arguing about this and the other. And it still means that you've managed to hold that human process um, that should be, I think, at the heart, the humanity at the heart of making rock or metal or anything, you know, all kinds of music that it's still intact, I think, is very, very, um, it's a joyous thing. And it's a thing that something should be celebrated. And I think maybe until I got this little moment, little, I suppose, a shard of light in again, um, it. I wasn't willing to really take a moment to just consider, God damn it, we've been at this a long time. And so I feel like we're accidental tourists. We've accidentally gone on holiday by mistake or whatever it was, that great quote um, from Withnail and I. We've gone on holiday by mistake. Sometimes it feels a little bit like that, that in the beginning, because you were on this rock on this island, you couldn't see really see a way off it. You didn't really... You could you 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 dreamt about going on tour, and then little by little things opened up. You you go over to your first gig in Belgium in ninety seven, first gig in Holland in ninety eight or whatever it was, um, and slowly but surely, you you know little parts of that dream or that the thing your aspirations opened up to you. You made a record, you made an album, you got to sit there and like hold it and go, God damn, we we actually made a record, which now seems so throw away um, but back then in 94 to actually or 93 to hold your own CD just when you go to box them and go look a box a box of our thing that we made we you know and then 20 you know 30 years later to, or to 28 or whatever it is 20 something years later to sit and pull out the same CD and, and, and see little handwritten notes from yourself to yourself in the future 
uh, which I used to do, um, you know, like writing little bits about lyrics and then or little bits on flyers and then stick them in. Um, this was written on 27th of August, 1995, uh, something blah, 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 contacts or something. Very strange. And also kind of really odd that you would write notes to yourself in the future that you only find 25, 30 years <laughs> um, in the future. Maybe um, I need to post some of them somewhere or something. Or maybe I don't. Maybe they're just for me. Actually, I think they're just for me. Um, which maybe would have been wise to apply this to the podcast before we um, did one episode of it. And I could have just become uh, a gardener or something and bought a plot of land somewhere and made vegetables. Maybe that was a wiser decision. I'm not sure if this uh, um, podcast really is that illuminating. What I'm trying to do, I suppose, is just ramble across. What were our aspirations? What did we, could we imagine? I mean, when we got to five albums, I, I, you know, I could, that was unfathomable to me. To me. And now that we've, I'm on the brink of making the 10th one sometime next year, I imagine. Um, does that feel like that will be it? I don't know. It's very hard to say because even then I still, um, we aren't that old. I mean, you know, we talk about last uh, last weekend we were discussing, you know, the the, the the John Neuvites, the Ishans, the people who made records when they were 16, 17 and 18. Um, and then you realise you made your own first record when you were 18 and your first demo when you were 17 or something. And you think to yourself, um, wow, we made those things when we were, what we think, do you think more than wow? <laughs> it's not the most insightful um, exclamation, but... Um, you didn't realise you were setting out on your life's work because you realise that you've been involved in making music uh, almost more, well, let's say more than two thirds of your life. So that the, the line in the sand where you were in the band longer than you weren't is long, long, long since passed. And so now you tread into, I don't know, what chapter of your creative life will this be? Um, I guess this remains to be seen. So I don't know. What exactly am I talking about? Who does? Who does? Who knows? I, I certainly don't know. I just thought I'd like to do a kind of rambling chat just across the origins, the, the, the first frames of mind of the band, our, our states of mind, our um, aspirations as young men. Like I said, the romantic notion that we just wanted to escape the dreary grey suburbs and the violence. I mean, that was true. But we didn't think we were going to be, we didn't, you know, our aspiration wasn't, okay, like TikTok guys, um, let's make, a, you know, um, an album now. And in, and in 18 months, then we're going to be sitting on a, a tour bus somewhere, um, sipping pina colada and, you know, in a hot tub somewhere. And we didn't have any aspirations like that. I think it's because we were underground guys and underground band. But also um, those kind of things just seemed so alien. They seemed like something straight out of 1985 or 1986 that by 1990, 91, just didn't exist anymore or maybe they just didn't really exist for Irish people anyway I don't think we make the best rock stars Thin Lizzy and Phil Innit uh, accepted however anyway episode 70 blah de blah de blah of Agitators Anonymous is just a ramble out of my grey matter about um, what it means or has meant to consider the idea of a career did we have a career by accident I think it's probably a correct way to express it um, none of us had a plan we didn't sit there and work out I remember sitting with um, the bass player of Oliver once upon a time and this is a long long time ago and they see he's like oh we had a plan to make this black and metal album then uh, you know an acoustic album and a pagan and blah 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 I was like wow okay oh god you guys really had a plan and then I realised like we had no plan we had no plan for anything and we still don't we still kind of stumble through things and half write songs and trust on our ability in the studio to to um to to make them and you know I there's I hear stories about like my friend goes oh you know Tribulation made 25 30 demo versions of that song with slightly different arrangements and I go wow we couldn't even make one <laughs> and I think that's partly that is the Irish way and we we you know we get there by the skin of our teeth with with sort of like grazed knuckles and we drag ourselves through but somehow the character and the character that we bring to that journey I find is maybe a little bit more, what can I say? I don't know. If you know Irish people, you'll know what I mean. And on that note, I think that will be the end of episode 70. Blah, 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 blah. I'm going to make a couple more of these, try and maybe involve Kieran and one of them make a video chat. Just kind of like 
ramshackly discuss elements of the band to sort of contemplate, celebrate, um, just sort of um, scratch the beard and consider the fact that this is actually the 30th anniversary of Primordial. Well, my friends, that's it. Agitators Anonymous, over and out. <laughs>